Hey everyone, Reed here with Big Strong Book, and today I'm going to be talking about The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad. So I've talked a little bit um, in past videos about uh, my love for Joseph Conrad. He is, I, I really started to dive into his uh, works last year, and he is quickly becoming one of my favorite authors. Um, I've read, you know, Heart of Darkness, uh, Narcissus, um, his novels Nostromo and Lord Jim, and now The Secret Agent is his third novel and fifth overall work uh, that I've read. And, you know, it's, I, I never am able to read a lot of Joseph Conrad in one go, or read uh, a, two of his novels back to back. Most authors I could do that with. Joseph Conrad is not one of them. I... Uh, Reading his novels takes a lot out of you, in a good way, I think. At least for me, for me, it's a good way. For me, I appreciate it. I, I, I like when a work can do that. Um, this novel, The Secret Agent, is uh, much, in, in ways, unlike uh, his other works that I've read and very similar to it at the same time. Kind of the overall um, themes and just vibe of... Uh, the foreboding, almost nihilism of life is present. And when I say foreboding nihilism of life, um, I, I, you know, I don't mean that in a very so dark, it'll turn you off completely from reading the work. It's, that's just the, the area of existence, I guess, that, um, that he is, that Conrad is interested in exploring. I compare it to the films of Werner Herzog, for example. Um, I think both directors, or <laughs> Werner Herzog as a film director explores uh, what Conrad as an author started to articulate. And while Conrad certainly has his forebearers, and I haven't really dived into or researched a lot of the influences that Conrad carried. And of, and of course, it's going to be varied because Conrad, Joseph Conrad was originally uh, Polish. He, you know, w w lived in Poland and uh, didn't, I don't, he wasn't fluent in English as I understand it until he was in his 20s. And of course, I believe all of his, all of his novels, maybe not everything he ever wrote, of course, but all of his novels and his major short stories, novellas, were all written in English. So maybe it's a little ironic and kind of cool too that uh, somebody that wasn't raised or didn't grow up, you know, wasn't a native speaker can have so much of a control and mastery over the English language. The best in my mind to do that where uh, it's a non-native speaker and writer uh, then being able to become fluent in the language is uh, Vladimir Nabokov. Vladimir Nabokov is an absolute pro stylist and wordsmith, um, at least in English. I've never read any of Nabokov's work that he originally wrote in Russian, um, but I'm sure the same effect will be had. I can just see it more in English. And if you were to approach somebody and if they were to read uh, one of Conrad's stories or read even one of Nabokov's stories, and you ask them, is this author English or is this author American? And they would say, I'm sure would say yes, or in terms of like, if at least maybe not nationality, because anybody can, you know, be English and American, even though they uh, may have grown up in a different country, but at least is, is English their first language? People would say yes, um, but it's not. And that's one thing that has always fascinated me about Joseph Conrad. And then, you know, he, so then living in, in and around England and writing in this uh, foreign language, even though he was fluent in it, foreign as to he didn't grow up with it, uh, I feel like he was almost always destined to have and not necessarily an outsider's perspective, because I don't want to make it seem like he was, you know, a foreigner, an outsider, anything like that. Even though there are, 
I'm sure he sympathizes in some ways with Verloc, who's the protagonist of the secret agent. Um, but it, it helps coming from non-English origins to then bring something new to the table, whether it be new ways of constructing prose and sentences or new ways to explore various themes. Um, the, the closest I can find in just thinking off the top of my head of other um, writers similar to Conrad, or at least that I think, you know, I think of Melville. Um, of course, you know, both authors are, they're, they're known for their seafaring story and brooding stories. Um, but I also think, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hawthorne and Melville in, in many ways are kind of cut from the same cloth. I, I believe they are, um, you know, they're contemporaries, both from either New, well, Melville was from New York, uh, Hawthorne from New Hampshire, but, you know, similar region of the country, um, even though I'm sure there are many New Yorkers that would freak out at any uh, association with New Englanders. <laughs> um, but I, Conrad owes so much, I think, to American authors that predated him rather than, you know, other English authors. Because, I mean, I think of, you know, you're just exiting the Victoria era, you know, Thackeray, um, Dickens, Eliot, um, I guess uh, Tennyson, and Yeats would, I guess, he would be coming into his own maybe at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so that's why C Conrad always... He's almost in many ways like the black sheep, uh, but not in a but in in the best possible way the black sheep. Um, so anyway, getting into the secret agent, it is a departure. If you're familiar with stuff like Lord, Lord Jim, uh, Lord Jim Narcissus, uh, and Heart of Darkness in particular, if you're familiar with those works, you know this is about it. It is set almost entirely within, or pretty much entirely within London, and it focuses on. Uh, Adolf Verloc, and Verloc is a shopkeeper um, who is also has anarchist uh, sympathies and is part of an anarchist terrorist cell. But then, of course, to muddy the waters even more, to make it a little more complex, he is uh, in essentially a secret agent for um, a foreign nation um, who they wish to, uh, for him to put in motion a terrorist attack so then they can get London on board uh, with passing legislation to, uh, to essentially to crack down further on anarchists. Because if London comes online, everybody else can, can kind of come on board with the idea and it will help this foreign nation out. And that is the charge that the ambassador places on Verloc, a very heavy one. And then in the midst of all of this, we have Verloc's uh, wife, Winnie. And she is kind of there in the background at the beginning, uh, but then comes out much more later on. Um, and then there is Winnie Verloc, so Adolf's wife, uh, her brother, Stevie. And Stevie, it's obvious through the text that Stevie has some sort of um, of uh, cognitive uh, intellectual disability. I I've read I'm just in in reading about a little bit about the secret agent online. Um, it's theorized or the 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 the, the deficits. Um, and the behavior that Stevie exhibits within the book, um, you might be led to believe that the character Stevie has autism, which is fascinating because I, so if Conrad was going for something like autism again, and I, I'm not sure when autism became more known and respected and, and researched for what we know it is today, you know, the, the, I think the autism spectrum, 
I forget when that was either established or where it was enumerated. Um, but I doubt it, I doubt it would have been, uh, you know, early 20th century. Um, they probably had a few uh, choice words for individuals uh, who had autism back then. They just, you know, didn't know to call it autism. They call it something else. Um, anyway, I, uh, so it's, I, but I've, I've never seen a character that obviously has a disability and it's not like a character and the character is not played off for laughs as one might assume from something of this era to not have something of sympathy. I think of when I think of the earliest example, at least of what I have read, where a character with uh, intellectual disabilities was portrayed in a sympathetic light. I think of uh, Lenny in Of Mice and Men. That's just the first example that comes to my head. And then, uh, of course, now just thinking about it, uh, Benji in The Sound and the Fury. Even though Stevie isn't, you know, he's not a point of view character within this. We don't uh, see into his mind, even though what's interesting is that Conrad kind of weaves in and out um, through perspectives. He's a little bit omniscient, and that kind of gets a little disorienting, not necessarily annoying, but it, it, it kind of, he, he walks the line a little bit there. Um, but anyway, so Verloc is tasked with uh, instigating this uh, terrorist attack, which is interesting because he has those uh, anarchist sympathies and ideas and sensibilities, but yet he's work he's working for a foreign government as an agent. So he is, uh, they are his his employer essentially. So it's it's great. It's dark. I I, I mean that's in my mind dark irony, um, and a lot of complexity that you can go with, and that complexity builds. And I was never sure where the story exactly was going to go. And the thing is, too, Conrad plays a, around with timelines and isn't clear like, oh, this, we're now jumping ahead a couple weeks or whatever, and we're now, or we're, we're jumping ahead and now we're jumping back. He doesn't make that clear, or at least it just, it flows in a way, which is interesting, but it, it kind of keeps you on your toes when you realize, oh, this isn't actually taking place when I think it's taking place. It's actually in the past. Um, very interesting. And, but again, as I, as I said, at the beginning of this, um, this is Conrad at his darkest, because he's dealing with these themes of anarchy, of almost the listless, purposeless momentum that it appears Conrad saw in London at the in the early 20th century as you know the the end of the Victorian era and of course anybody who knows a little bit about that era of history knows that um anarchist uh terrorist activities linked to anarchism was a very real thing during this time of course here in America I mean the the biggest thing that comes to mind for me is uh, William McKinley, President William McKinley, 1901, uh, was assassinated by Leon Cholgaz, who was an anarchist, a sort of self-proclaimed anarchist. I think, um, I mean, this is moving beyond the uh, time frame of this novel, but then in the early 30s, or he, net, uh, actually disregard that, I think, the, I was thinking of the assassination attempt on FDR when he was running for president in 32, that assassin might have been a professed socialist rather than anarchist. Um, so maybe, but I think even, it was maybe more prevalent in Europe, uh, kind of anarchist cells or there, there was more of a real fear of, of these things starting to happen. And, you know, with, I mean, you know, living in a, a post 9-11 world where these types of were just, you know, random acts of terrorism can arguably happen at any moment. Um, and you're just kind of 
like in a, in a, in a listless uh, stumble almost. Certainly, you know that's America after nine eleven. You just you have this shock, this horrific shock to the the system of of a government and a nation, and. I wonder if Conrad felt that, not that there was like an inciting incident necessarily, but that he just felt that, you know, exiting the Victorian age and entering into the 20th century, entering into all this unknown, all this darkness, that he was just reflecting kind of this, maybe a tension of fear that was bubbling around the surface, but nobody really wanted to talk about it, but it was always there, but it's just, you know, it's best not to talk about it because you can't figure out the words to communicate that with somebody. And it, I think he, this, this book, it, it never lost me. I think the, all the Conrad I've read is great, is phenomenal works. I think this, maybe takes a little bit of a backseat for me because getting to the final uh, maybe 30% of the book, it, it, it took a little bit. It, 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 it kind of lost the pacing and the momentum a little bit along the way until we really just, the book then shifts and we are seeing a Winnie Verloc's perspective. That's when I was hooked in. I was full speed ahead to the end. Um, I was really into it and then it made sense and I'm like, okay, now I get why he did this, this, and this. Um, it makes sense. This is very interesting. So I think I would appreciate The Secret Agent more on a reread. Um, and, you know, if if there were a lot of, I'm, I'm curious, so if you know, let me know in the comments, if there were, um, you know, anarchist terrorist incidents that happened in London or in England or um, big ones that happened in Europe kind of at the turn of the 20th century that may have inspired or informed uh, Conrad's writing of this novel. I'd appreciate that. Just that might help add um, some more context to potentially to the frame of mind he was in as he was writing this. Um, but, you know, if I, I, I kind of shake my head a little bit when I go to sites like Goodreads, and I see that Conrad just doesn't seem to click with people. Um, when you know the the average star rating for his books, for his major works, is you know three and a half out of five stars, which you know may seem still positive, but on Goodreads, of course, if something has you know maybe below a three seven five it's a little bit of a head scratch and you wonder, well, maybe then, then you're, it's borderline divisive. And I get why Conrad is divisive. Um, you know, anything about his works, the titles of his works, even um, you're, you know, you're going to be like, mm, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Conrad is such an important figure. Um, and he is with his mastery of language that's another thing, too. If you love just almost as you're reading it, and even if you're not listening to an audiobook, but you're just kind of hearing the sentence in your mind, replaying it, it reads so well when you just sink into the prose. And this is not one of his more prose-heavy novels. Uh, I think of Nostromo as his most dense, and Nostromo is the most difficult of all of his Kind of like that. It, he plays around with timelines too. I remember at the beginning of uh, the first chunk of Nostromo is just, con you know, constant referring back and being like, "Did I miss something? Did I miss something?" Um, but you know, if you've if you've read even just Heart of Darkness, if a lot of people have read Heart of Darkness, it seems very common to be uh, um, assigned that in college or high school, um, even. I, I would say, you know, I, I would agree with most everybody and say Heart of Darkness is probably a good entry. Uh, Secret Agent, I think, would be another good entry um, or like a good entry point into Conrad's works. No to things like Lord Jim or, or Nostromo. I love Lord Jim, especially um, the, the opening 
scenes and sequences of that are just and and then the ending oh my my goodness it's incredible i've always wanted to see Werner herzog do an adaptation of lord jim i want to see it happen i want to see it happen um it's i i'm a little surprised that if herzog has never made a serious attempt to um adapt any of conrad's works i you know a little surprised but i I, I think Herzog would be a perfect director uh, for those to to adapt uh, those works, and I'd be first in line to see them. I uh, and this, I think of of the major. I think now I've read all the big uh, Conrad works. Maybe I haven't read Under Western Eyes uh, or Victory. Um, those are two that I've heard great things about that I haven't read yet. I know that he did a few novels with Ford Maddox Ford. Haven't read any of those. Have heard that mm, they're they're a little bit on the so so side and only for you know if for Conrad completionists. Um, anyway, so Secret Agent. If if you like Conrad, you're gonna really dig this. Um, maybe not his best work from my point of view, but uh, something that I think will improve, will certainly improve on a reread now that I know where the story goes and how everything kind of fits together. Um, so, Secret Agent, or just the works of Joseph Conrad, if you have read any of them, let me know what you think, and as always, I will see you guys next time.